And joining us now on the debate in New York, New York, Christian Freeland, global editor at large for Reuters News Service, and Seamus Kahn, professor in the Department of Sociology at Columbia University. And with us here in studio, Armin Yalnesian, senior economist with the Center for Policy Alternatives, and Partha Mohanram, professor at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And it's good to welcome you here once again, you here for the first time, and to our guests uh, in the States. Nice to have you on as well. Chris, I haven't seen you in a long time. We're still taking credit for you, you know. You're still Canadian, right? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Okay, I'm good. I'm wearing a red dress even. That's Perfect. Canadian, right? well, very very flag-like of you. All right, that's good to know. I'm going to start, actually, Christian, by reading something, a little excerpt of what you wrote in The Atlantic in the January-February 2011 issue. And here we go. As with the aristocracies of bygone days, such vast wealth has created a gulf between the plutocrats and other people, one reinforced by their withdrawal into gated estates, exclusive academies, and private planes. We are mesmerized by such extravagances as Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen's 414-foot yacht, The Octopus, which is home to two helicopters, a submarine, and a swimming pool. But while their excesses seem familiar, even archaic, today's plutocrats represent a new phenomenon. The bulk of their wealth is generally the fruit of hustle and intelligence, with presumably some luck thrown in. They are not aristocrats, by and large, but rather economic meritocrats, preoccupied not merely with consuming wealth, but with creating it. Okay, Christian, follow up on that if you would, because that goes against all the conventional wisdom. So I guess my first question is one word. Really? Yes, absolutely. So a really big thing is happening that I think a lot of us, you know, are, are shy about talking about, which is there is this huge and growing income inequality with a winner-take-all phenomenon, particularly at the very top. However, what is also interesting, and, and you know, this is particularly the work of a guy called Emmanuel Saez at Berkeley and Thomas Piketty uh, in France, have found that this wealth, compared to say, you know, the last time you had this kind of plutocracy emerging in the Gilded Age, this time around these people are, as Emmanuel Saez calls them, the working rich. They are generating much more of their wealth through their actual income, through companies they've founded, as opposed to being a hereditary aristocracy. Seamus, should we take comfort from that? Um, we can take a certain amount of comfort for it. I mean, I'm, I'm a little less optimistic about it, in part because, though it's certainly the case that the rich are increasingly making their money um, from earnings, um, it's not the case that there's a lot of mobility in the United States, or, in fact, globally, mobility seems to be going down a little bit. So while it's true that the wealthy are increasingly making their own money, um, receiving paychecks, it also happens to be the case that many, many people uh, are experiencing a lot of stagnation, um, both at the top and at the bottom, and that people aren't, aren't so able to change their position uh, as they used to be, say, in the 60s and 70s. Okay, Armin, let me follow up with you. Obviously, massive income inequality is not a good thing uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, some of which we'll get into today. But is it somewhat better than, say, the aristocrats of old, because these guys made it themselves. Well, the, actually, there is a, I hate to say this, a data issue from the data that Krista is talking about. So the you're not buying the premise yet? Not quite, because okay. we're not entirely sure if this is a whole new way of earning or just a, a, a different way of seizing the money from the corporations that they always had. Um, and that requires actually more research. Uh, you know, Emmanuel Saez and Michael Veal in Canada did the comparison between Canada and the U.S. Um, and in Canada, we're also seeing the rise of the richest 1%. Yes, they are working more, but it could be that they're just taking the winnings out of their company in a way that their fortunes don't rise and fall with the fortunes of the companies that they founded. Or it could be, in the case of Canada, that there are more very high-level uh, workers who are actually managers and not owners of the company because it's multinationals that own these companies and not actually owner operated corporations increasingly. So there's other things that could be driving it, but frankly, the issue of inequality used to be driven by recessions and the gap that grew between uh, the poor and everybody else. And now, in really good economic times, it's being driven by the gap between the rich and the rest of us. And that, as Krista's Chris, work shows, is actually driving a whole new politics of growing inequality. What do you say on this, Partha? Um, Christia used the term meritocrats. Uh, that's something I don't necessarily agree with. You know, I've done a lot of research on, let's say, executive compensation. Firstly, I think it's not one uniform set of super rich. You have to distinguish between the entrepreneur, 
And I have no problem saying that Bill Gates uh, and Steve Jobs in a slightly earlier time or Larry Prage and Sergey Brin or Mark Zuckerberg, they've earned their money. I'm not so convinced that the CEOs of companies and hedge fund managers have earned their money necessarily. I was just going to say, you're looking and at Wall Street now, right? The reason why I'm saying this is, uh, let's just take the hedge fund industry for instance, okay, or financial services in general. People are generally compensated for uh, creating alpha or excess returns, right? Uh, I don't want to discuss Greek here, but I, I contend that most of this alpha is actually beta. What I mean by that is they're just taking risk. And in good times, risk gives you returns. And mm -hmm. instead of saying that I took a risk and got rewarded, they say, you know what? You earned this money because of my superior uh, stock picking ability. And now give me this uh, you know, 20, 2 plus 20 or whatever I deserve to get. The reason why, you can say that it's okay because you know, somebody uh, is willingly paying for it, but that's not really fair because at some, in many of these cases, the taxpayer is the backstop. So we are sort of uh, uh, compensating them or at least subsidizing their risk. So I, in my opinion, uh, while entrepreneurs might have earned it, I'm not convinced that CEOs with the sort of the way the executive compensation is determined or people in financial services industry, okay. they've necessarily earned it. Let me go to Christian on this and ask you, do you make the distinction between those like Bill Gates who actually made it and those perhaps on Wall Street who, um, I, I don't want to be pejorative in the way I describe it, but you know what I'm getting at here. Go ahead, Christian, what do you say? Um, sure, absolutely. I, I would totally agree with Partha, and I would um, slice it and dice it maybe even more finely than that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there is, you know, the entrepreneurial group, and, and we are seeing, you know, undeniably, I think a consequence of globalization, of the technology revolution is, you know, if you're in the right place at the right time, you have a really great idea, you can go from zero to a global company more quickly now than in lots of other periods. You know, just think about Facebook or think about Groupon. You know, these are companies that went from nothing to really being forces, you know, in the case of Facebook that are not only, you know, huge companies but changing the world. Uh, having said that, I totally agree with Partha. I would say Partha mentioned CEOs but didn't talk about them. You know, I think that something that is happening is the culture of compensation has changed and, you know, it, it is a very incestuous group that sets compensation levels for CEOs and I think that it is absolutely right to question you know are the CEOs worth every penny that they're paid or is it just sort of within that clubby world that boards decide that that's how much they should get and you know how much control really do the shareholders in a publicly traded company have over the CEO on Wall Street the other finer distinction I would make Partha talked about hedge funds Actually, I think hedge funds are, and people running hedge funds are the people who are the most entrepreneurial and benefiting the least from this kind of, you know, culture of compensation and from being bailed out by taxpayers. After all, in the financial crisis, the hedge funds, lots of hedge funds failed, but they didn't have to be bailed out. The place where I think you're really seeing people making a lot of money, uh, but having the taxpayer bail them out when they make losses is in the big banks. You know, that, that's what we saw on Wall Street, and that's a place where I, I do think we can raise legitimate concerns and say, you know, wait a minute, how come you guys are making tens of millions of dollars in salary, but then when your company is in trouble, you know, in places like America, the UK, taxpayers have to foot the bill. Seamus, what do you think on that? I, I mean, I, w I would say that I think that the, the problems are much broader than than just the small group of people who are making a tremendous amount of money. There's certainly a problem, but I think it's far more endemic. Um, and I would make a distinction between people making money and people extracting money. Um, and if you just look between you know, 1969 and today, in the United States, 100% of the growth in national income has gone to the top 10%. The bottom 90% of Americans have actually seen a drop in their gross income. I mean. It's not the case. It, you, one would be very hard pressed to argue that the bottom 90% of Americans aren't working um, or that they're not taking advantage of some of the productivity gains. Instead, what's happening is the top 10% is finding ways to extract money um, from within the economy so that the people in the bottom 10% are in comparatively poor positions. And so I would say, you know, I, I would be maybe a little bit more radical. It's not that the Bill Gateses of the world are making money and the hedge fund people aren't. What they're all basically doing is extracting a higher percentage of the overall produced social wealth. And, um, and so this is where a lot of the issues are coming from. Having said that, Armin, you know, 
Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Ted Turner have given away billions. Does this group of, uh, I don't know, plutocrats, meritocrats, aristocrats, whatever we want to call them, do they seem to be more willing to share than the super rich of the past? Well, you know, when you say aristocrats, I think about that dirty joke, but <laughs> like, I'm not quite sure if this is a dirty <laughs> joke, what's going on. I actually want to go back to Seamus's point. What these three people do with their winnings um, is, you know, we can have a whole debate on that, but there's a big structural issue that's going on that involves you, me, everybody that's watching, and all the people that aren't watching, which is what is happening to the average worker. So, you know, the banks are uh, taking none of the risk, but uh, reaping all of the rewards in the United States. That's not that dissimilar here. There's been a huge risk shift in who is exposed to the, econ the macroeconomic situation we've got. Our macro at, at the median level, 50% of the workers actually are working at a lower inflation-adjusted rate than they were in the late 1970s. They're better educated. They're working longer hours. What gives? You know, this is about the social contract. And I don't, I don't want to actually overstate this, but there's something going on around the world. And when you take a look at how far you can push people into saying, play by the rules of the game, but only we're going to win, and you're going to fuel the way we are winning. But you're talking government policy here, right? No, I'm talking about the culture that Christian's been talking about, the culture of entitlement as to, way, to the way the bosses are being paid. That's supposed to be okay, but if you're a public sector union, you're entitled to too much. Suddenly having a pension is too rich. You should be taking a wage cut. You should, t take a look at what's happening in Madison, Wisconsin. Suddenly... A, a, a piece of paper that had been signed, a contract, is being thrown out the window. Why? Because suddenly the public sector workers are the reason why the government is facing a, um, a deficit. Like something weird is going on well, here. Well, they did that in Ontario to, 20 years ago too, remember? Indeed. And, yeah. and I guess the question here is, you know, who's, who's entitled to what? And what's the rules of the game now? The rules of the game are up, up for grabs in terms of the question. We should have been raising these questions after the financial crisis. We didn't. Now what's going on in other parts of the world are actually making us think again, wait a minute, how, how are we all tied to one another? What's the deal? Partha, let me read something here. This is an excerpt from a special report in The Economist on global leaders. I'm going to read this excerpt and get you to comment first. Okay. It goes like this. The global wealth pyramid has a very wide base and a sharp point. The richest 1% of adults control 43% of the world's assets. The wealthiest 10% have 83%. The bottom 50% have only 2%. This suggests a huge disparity of influence. The wealthiest tenth control the vast bulk of the world's capital, giving them a lot of say in funding businesses, charities, and politicians. The bottom 50% control hardly any capital at all. That said, this huge group includes people in quite different circumstances. Many young people in rich countries have no assets and a wallet full of maxed out credit cards. Technically, their debts make them poorer than African peasants who have nothing, but they enjoy a much higher standard of living and far better prospects. At the apex of the pyramid, there are 81,000 people with assets of more than $50 million. Of these, some 30,000 have more than $100 million, and 2,800 have more than $500 million. Nestled into the sharp tip at the top, Credit Suisse reckons there are about $1,000 billionaires. Who's at the top? Um, that's an, actually an excellent question, and um, I just want to tie it into the points some of the panelists have already made. Um, inequality in itself is not necessarily a bad thing if everybody is getting, uh, sort of improving the standard of life at the same time. Uh, I'll bring an analogy. I'm actually going to be leading a student tour uh, of MBA students to my uh, native country, which is India. Now, India is a country with rising income inequality, but it's also a country which is growing at 8%. So the person who's at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, if he or she is going to see an improvement in his or her standard of living, He's less likely to, he or she is less likely to sort of begrudge the super rich getting richer at a faster rate. Because we, we have a time series mentality, right? We always focused on, uh, is life better for me today than it was yesterday? And the rising tide is lifting yeah, all and it's, and, and it, when you're growing at 8%, uh, you, you know, trickle down economics does work. The problem is uh, exactly like, uh, you know, Seamus uh, mentioned in this country, uh, in North America in general and Europe as well, uh, where, uh, a vast majority of the workforce has seen either stagnant or declining real wages, while a very small percentage has benefited. And uh, you know, as long uh, this this notion of let's say an American dream or whatever you want to call it, where people don't mind other people being richer because they feel as though they also have an opportunity, 
I think that's becoming more and more of a myth as time goes you by. Said, you said trickle down works and Armenia and Lesian's eyebrows went up. No, so I want to go I'm, to her next. Hang on. Just, just to elaborate. In some circumstances. In some circumstances. Okay, yes. go ahead, Armenia. You wanted uh, to follow up. Well, in fact, maybe globally it does at the moment we're in. But in terms of the old advanced countries, that oh. is, is not panning out. We're not oh, seeing that happening agree. in Canada. On that you agree. Christian, again, with, the, with this pyramid, who's at the top of this pyramid of these, of these where were they here, $1,000 billionaires? Uh, do you mind, Steve, if I just go back to what Armin and Partha were talking about just for one minute? Seems to be contagious, so go ahead. Yes, all right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Um, no, but I, I think this point about what's happening globally versus what is happening nationally in the developed industrialized countries is a really important one. And, and it's part of what is sort of paradoxical and difficult about what's going on. Because actually, income inequality between countries is decreasing. And, you know, I remember when I was in junior high school in Peace River, uh, we had to write an essay about how would you solve the problems of the poor of India. And I remember all of us agonizing over it. And, you know, I remember um, the essay that my teacher liked the most was, first of all, I would take an aspirin because this is unsolvable. Hmm. But actually, <laughs> India is doing a pretty good job right now. You know, as Partha says, growing at 8%. And that is terrific. You know, one thing that we're seeing is hundreds of millions of people, particularly in India and China, who are living in absolute poverty, being raised up. That's terrific. What makes this a more difficult and complicated process is that at the same time, we're seeing stagnation for the middle class in the Western industrialized countries. And what is sort of a scary conclusion for me is maybe these processes aren't disconnected. And, you know, maybe this global super elite, those billionaires that you were talking about, Steve, those are the people around the world who, you know, because of luck, because of intelligence, whatever, um, are the ones who are figuring out the most how to kind of ride this wave of globalization and technological change. And then the people at the very bottom in the whole world are also benefiting. The people in the middle who happen to be most of the people in Canada and the United States are getting squeezed. So Seamus, uh, I'm going to try this. Uh, that, that's fine, Krisha, I get you, but I am going to try this one more time. <laughs> Because you did refer sorry, to it at sorry. the end there. No, that's cool. Uh, I did. I tried. <laughs> these people who got all this money, we know the big names. We know the Bill Gateses and we know the Mark Zuckerbergs and so on. Who else is up there that's got all this wealth? What do they do? How did they make it? Um, well, actually, they're an incredibly diverse group. So it's fairly difficult to, to give you a really straight answer. It depends on where we look. I mean, in India, we'd be looking at steel magnates in Mexico. We're looking at uh, people who are responsible for... Um, uh, cellular phone technology um, here in the United States. A lot of it is tied to uh, the tech boom. Some of it's tied to old mo money. You know, the Rockefellers are still around. Um, they're actually a pretty diverse group. And so, I, you know, I would say that to understand who they are isn't so much to understand what's going on within the economy. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're a broad-based group of people, um, and what we need to know more about is less who these individuals are and more how is it that the economy has been restructured in the last 40 years that's allowed a diverse group of individuals to seize more and more of the national and global wealth. Before I go there, that's, that's a good point. Before I go there, I do want to pick up on restructuring, but in Armin, I am, I am going to talk about how governments have restructured tax policy to either aid and abet this or whatever. Because it wasn't that long, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, the personal income tax rates in Canada and the United States were, you know, 80% or something like that, close to 90 anyway. We're a long way south of that today. Governments have made it a point to bring personal and corporate tax rates down as much as they have felt they could. Has that contributed to all of this? Without question. And, you know, that has been, irrespective of political stripe, every government has cut taxes. That has been part of our drinking water for the last 30 years, and it connects to the trickle-down. Uh, theology, which is that if you give the rich more money, they'll invest it, that'll cre create more jobs, everybody will be better off, and globally that might in fact work. But domestically it did not work, and what happened, as you mentioned, is, well, the, last, the, the top marginal tax rate in Canada was 80% in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, and that was on incomes that, if you translate them into Canadian, into current dollar terms, would be about on incomes above two and a half million dollars. Now we have people that make more than two and a half million dollars today, 
the top marginal tax rate is something like 29 percent and it kicks in at about $135,000 which a lot of people that make more than that feel like they're, they're in the middle class they don't feel like they're the rich so what we basically said is we want you to keep your money we don't want you to now mind you the rich people contribute most of the personal income taxes at the same time we've also been cutting corporate taxes so we're basically saying taxes are a bad thing we're not going to raise incomes on people uh, for the middle class and for the lower class. Well, so consequently, if you're actually strangling your source of revenues and not keeping up with it, you're losing all those extra things that were the social wage. You're losing the libraries, the pools, the rinks, the community centers, the access to health care. Like, we're under constant stress. Can we hang on to these things that make life better? Plus, we're not expanding the pocketbook issues. Has government tax policy I mean, contributed to this, Partha? Actually, I'd like to, I guess, largely agree with what uh, you know, uh, has been said. Um, you I'll give you an, uh, yeah, actually, I do. You're at the Rotman School, and you're at the Center for I am, Policy Alternatives. I and am, we have agreement on the this. Facts, ma'am. I'm <laughs> at I'm at the Rotman School. I've always considered myself to be centrist or left of center as far as you know economic views are concerned. I'll give you an example on taxation. Uh, you know, uh, you know, from the uh, the carried uh, interest thing, which uh, Christia raised in her own oh, her own article. Uh, hedge fund managers get away with essentially getting income and paying the sort of uh, long term capital gains tax on it simply because of a tax loophole. I'll give you another, uh, another example. In my country, India, uh, a law was passed around 10 years ago. Dividends are exempt from income tax. And this was done ostensibly to help the equity markets. What it essentially helps is these large industrial magnates who own 40% of the company or 50% of the company, mm -hmm. they can declare a $50 million, $100 million dividend. They get to keep 50% of it because they own 50% of the firm. They don't pay any taxes. Hmm. This is the most regressive sort of taxation scheme you can come up with. Okay. So I uh, certainly taxation has played a big role in, in or let's say, uh, this, the word tax has become so pejorative. Yeah. Seamus that is it's, it's had a negative bit to get influence. in. Go ahead, Seamus. Yeah, I, if I could just jump in here. I think it's important to make a distinction between personal income taxes and corporate income taxes, in part because the economic evidence is a little mixed on these two. Um, you know, if, if, if Canadian viewers can believe it, in the United States, the... Uh, the marginal tax on the highest earners in the 1960s was 91 percent, um, so even higher than Canada. And it was during this period that the United States had some of its highest job growth throughout the 1960s. And so actually there's, there's a lot of evidence that shows that there isn't that much of a relationship between personal income tax and growth. Um, that you can tax wealthier people at really high rates and you can still have considerable economic growth. On corporate income tax, actually, the, the story is a little bit more mixed. That really high corporate income taxes can constrain economic growth, um, and I would say here that some of the findings that we've been hearing about the ways in which the wealthy are working more is in part because um, when the marginal tax rate's at 91 percent, you have a huge incentive not to take earnings on the highest amount of money that you're making because you're going to spend 91 cents on a dollar in taxes, but when it shifts to the 20s to 30 percents, you might be willing to pick that tax on that income and take the cash, because unlike owning a company or a factory or something like that, cash is so much more mobile. So, so it's, Seamus, can I, mean, I understand this? I think this? that the, the real you, attention should be on this personal income tax issue. Can I understand this? You're saying it's actually theoretically possible to raise more revenue with 29 percent personal income tax rates than with 91 percent personal income tax no, rates? No, no, I'm sorry. If I, if, if, if I gave that I impression at all, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm misleading you. Um, what I'm saying is that personal income tax rates don't have a huge impact on growth, so you can actually raise them tremendously um, uh, without really affecting uh, the overall wages of the nation okay. um, or the overall employment of the nation. Gotcha. Let me get Corporate Christian on this then. Tax is a different story. Let me get Christian on this, just on this whole issue of how government tax policy has either uh, helped or hindered or whatever the uh, meritocrats that you've been writing about in the Atlantic. Um, well, sure. So I'm going to boringly agree with what everybody else has said that you know tax policy <laughs> has sort of leaned into the phenomenon but I, I do think there are two important things to bear in mind one is you know particularly in the United States where probably you know tax policy and you know the intense belief in free markets and in trickle-down economics has been strongest there has been a real pushback and I think an effort particularly on the left to attribute this rise, the emergence of the plutocracy, almost exclusively to politics and to tax policy. And that, I think, is a mistake. You know, I think certainly politics, in particular 
the taxes and de deregulation of the financial sector has contributed to this, has intensified it. That's part of the reason you see more income inequality in the United States than you do in Canada. But I think we have to accept the fact that there are some bigger sort of global economic phenomenon driving that. And if you don't appreciate that that's part of what's going on, I think that you can't, you know, really understand how to work with it. The other thing is I think that Seamus makes a really good point, and, that, and that's part of why this is such a hard issue to deal with, which is we do actually want more growth in our economies, particularly innovation-led growth. I mean, think about Canada. It's great that Canada has RIM, isn't it? Wouldn't Canada like more innovative companies? You know, that's one of the things that Rotman focuses on a lot and it is really dedicated to. And so even as, you know, you want to have public policy that is aware of income inequality, doesn't increase it too much, you have this other driver of public policy is, which is trying to be an innovation economy and trying to encourage that. And it can be hard to reconcile those two things. Okay, a couple of follow-ups here in the studio. I mean, you first. Okay, well, so if low corporate taxes are, are the way to actually move forward on this to spur innovation, we should have seen an explosion of business investment in the last 10 years. We have dropped our per, uh, corporate income tax rate by 10 percentage points in the last 10 years, and the rate of business investment as a share of the economy is at exactly the same level it was today That's as it was in 2000. It, far be it for me to disagree with an economist who knows this way better than I do, but there's a difference between what the numbers say and what the actual, right, what the effective rate is. Right? Our corporate tax rates may be technically lower than the United States, but the rate that businesses no, actually pay uh, after the deductions are, are not. I'm saying that, first of all, we've got a lower rate of co uh, corporate taxes than in the U.S., but in Canada, we have dropped our, our rate of taxation by 10 percentage points. That's a big drop. Mm -hmm. And our rate of business investment has not increased. At, so we've, we've gone from 29 percent to 18 percent. And, and in the 1960s, when we had the most investment, our corporate tax rate was 40%. So there is also a weak relationship between corporate taxation. But I want to go back to, it's not just corporate taxes. It's not just personal income taxes. It's also the way we treat savings. So most Canadians, like we're dealing with record levels of household debt, most Canadians are having trouble making ends meet, forget about saving. So what does the government do in the middle of the deepest recession we've had since the uh, 1930s? It introduces the tax-free savings account which is going to leak billions and billions upon billions more revenues in the coming years. So it is like a, a kind of a global way of looking at if you've got money, you should keep it. But we're not going to actually to harness any of this growth to make the world better for other people. And we're actually, we actually think you're greedy if you think you deserve to hang on to what you've got if you're in the middle. Partha. I'd just like to sort of um, mention that there's not necessarily complete agreement among the plutocrats. On taxation, just take the whole estate tax issue, right? You have people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett who are completely against estate, uh, estate tax uh, repeal, saying that think about the great institutions in America which exist because of estate tax. People who want to fund great institutions, you know, universities or whatever, simply because uh, they would rather uh, give that away rather than sort of pay uh, whatever percentage to taxation. So I think. Um, uh, the other, the issue about uh, taxation policy is taxation also spurs uh, charitable giving, which is uh, which sort of picks up the slack in many cases where the government is either unwilling or unable to do so, whether it's higher education, research, and so on and so forth. And I think that aspect of taxation should also not be ignored. Can I follow up with Shane? Can I jump in? Oh, all right, go ahead, Christian, on that. No, I was just going to very quickly jump in to what Partha said. So, Partha, I agree with you. And I, you know, was tremendously encouraged. You know, Warren Buffett also has been um, very strongly uh, in favor of a change to the treatment of carried interest, which is this absurd thing where, you know, as Warren Buffett puts it, he pays less tax than his secretary. Um, and, and I was very encouraged by that. What has been astonishing for me, though, is Barack Obama is a Democrat, uh, and yet they haven't changed the taxation of carried interest. And a big reason is because the Wall Street lobby on this issue is tremendously strong. It's tremendously well-funded. And a lot of the guys who are funding it are Democrats. You know, I have talked to people who have worked in Democratic administrations who gave money to Barack Obama to be elected, who, you know, I thought were like good progressive guys. And they give you this really impassioned line about how, you know, if the tax on carried interest is changed, you know, that's a crime. 
<laughs> two, two, Bartha, two, go ahead. Two names. Mm -hmm. Larry Summers and Bob Rubin. <laughs> Democrats. <laughs> That's Democrats, all I have to say. Both with ties both, to Wall both Street. Both with incredibly strong ties to Wall Street. So, uh, I mean, this is not a Democrat versus Republican issue. Hmm. I want, I do, you did say something, though, that I wanted to follow up with Seamus on, and that is the, the, the idea of who, who with the biggest pots of money can do more good. And Seamus, we have seen that Bill Gates is marshalling his, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of philanthropy into trying to eradicate diseases all over the world and improving educational standards and so on. Is it possible that, that these foundations can actually do more and better good than governments with similar pools of money? Uh, you know, I really worry about this, this kind of framing in part because it strikes me as a further attack on the effectiveness in, of government, right? That um, social services don't need to be provided by states. Instead, they can be provided by, you know, pseudo-corporate entities, which are foundations. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, I don't know enough about the evidence on this as to whether or not something like the Gates Foundation is more effective than government intervention. But I would just throw out caution here in suggesting that we always need to distrust government. We always need to think that government can't be the answer. There has to be a better, uh, somewhat private answer. And further, that um, we shouldn't forget that these things are voluntary. Um, so it's the case that um, you know, Gates is choosing to give his money away, but the next Bill Gates may choose to keep it all. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in making these things voluntary, we have no guarantees uh, that there'll be patterns of philanthropic giving um, through the future. Um, and for, you know, we, we hear a lot about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett choosing to give their money away. There's an easier way than what they're proposing, which is a 50% gift. It's to tax them at 50%. Then not just Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, <laughs> but everyone has to pay it. And it, it, it also doesn't then undermine um, uh, the, the effectiveness or, or the sense that, you know, government's just a terrible institution that always needs to be okay. mistrusted. Yeah, it, yeah I, do, I do have to say, now you weren't laughing for the reason, I mean, you were not laughing for the reasons that Christian was laughing. But I think, Christian, you were laughing because you just said, my hunch is you're thinking that is a complete non-starter. That's not going anywhere. Am I right about that, Christian? Is that why you left? What, about the 50% taxation? Exactly. Uh, well, it's certainly not going anywhere in the United States, yeah, where, you know, as Armin was pointing <laughs> out, um, you know, the, the anti-tax philosophy, mm -hmm. I, I think, if anything, is getting stronger right now. Mm -hmm. But I do think Seamus's point is a really strong one. And, you know, maybe to complement that point, I would say, you know, obviously, philanthropy is great. And philanthropy by smart entrepreneurs who apply their brains to giving away their money, like Bill Gates, uh, is a terrific thing. But I think we also have to be aware of the possible downsides of the privatization of public policy. Hmm. Something that's happening very sort of vigorously in the United States right now is uh, sort of hedge fund guys going in to funding schools and you can do this through charter schools and in some ways it's really terrific but in some ways I, I find it a little bit frightening because you know it's people who send their own kids to private schools who get to kind of experiment with the public schools where poor people send their kids and you know kind of try things out to me that that's a little bit worrying you know a, a, as Seamus was saying you know some of these things actually we want the government to be doing with all, you know, sure, government bureaucracy is, is slow and ungainly, but at least it's publicly accountable. All right. Armin, a few minutes to go. You, you're nodding your head through that whole speech. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, I mean, we look at the rise of these great philanthropists, and, and some of them are doing great stuff, but it is a kind of noblesse oblige sort of sentiment, right? And we, we've been through this. This is like a story we went through 200 years ago. So there's going to be great philanthropers and there's going to be lousy th philanthropists, but the point is, do you want somebody, do you want the rise of the rich to determine who is the deserving poor or not? Well, or do you this? want to actually, I mean, government is us. Government isn't some alien object. Government we, changes its mind in the States every two years now. So well, do, you but, want, do you want education funding to, or education policy funded depending on that? But there is some stability. There is some st stability. It's not the capriciousness mm -hmm. that uh, Seamus pointed out. 
and, and I think that's a really important thing for us to think about is who do you want to call the shots on the big stories, whether it's education. And in fact, speaking of education in Canada, who is the vo like philanthropists can actually be funding the right voices and defunding other voices. We've lost lots of public think tanks that actually advocate for the poor. And the ones that have risen up, we've got an addition of three or four more think tanks and their budgets have multiplied in the last few years. That's because there's more money from the banks and other rich people. Parthi, you want a quick word on this? Um, see, the, the, like I mentioned before, the word tax has become such a pejorative word that uh, it's going to be almost politically, be, uh, politically uh, impossible for any administration uh, to talk about raising taxes. Um, and and the, the right, and I'm talking about America here, has been very successful in getting a large percentage of the U.S. population to vote against their economic interests. Mm -hmm. hmm. And they do it in a very successful way by sort of conflating economic and social issues. There's no way the right is going to deliver on the social issues. Mm -hmm. But it gets the voters on the social issues, whether it be abortion, whether it be sort of religion and so on and so forth. And by doing so, it's sort of it's able to get its economic message across. Although, that's that's just that's a, a, a strong view I have. And that's why um, most of America is in the 90% we talked about. And they still vote against their economic interests mm -hmm. all the time. Seamus, you want the last word tonight? Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I, just to quickly jump in on this, um, with a little bit of hope. I mean, if you if you ask I Americans to look at like levels of income inequality, um, they don't think they live in America. They think they live in Sweden. So they think that they live in a place where there isn't nearly as much income inequality as there is. And if you ask them where they'd like to live, they tell you that they they basically like to live in a utopia where there's far lower levels of inequality. And so I would say that there might be a little bit of optimism here, which is to talk about the ways in which you know, the vast majority of people really do want to see lower levels of inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and there are ways in which one can mobilize to think about how you might make such lower levels of inequality real, um, which will involve you know, talking, I think, about tax policy, although I am sensitive to the fact that it's more than just taxes. Mm. And on that very Canadian notion, I want to thank our guests, uh, both of whom are in the United States today. Christian Freeland, Global Editor at Large for Reuters. Thanks so much for being there for us, Christia. And Seamus Khan, Pleasure. Sociology Professor at Columbia, also in our studios in New York City. Thanks so much to you two. Thanks for having me. And back here in our studios in Toronto, Partha Mohanram, Rotman School. Rookie, rookie, rookie venture today on the program. Your debut, I guess is how we would put it. Nicely done. <laughs> and Armin Yalnizian, Senior Economist at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Thanks so much to you two as well.